Right. Um, welcome back to the penultimate session already of the, the conference. Uh, thanks for sticking with it if you have. It's been really interesting, I've found. Uh, just to introduce uh, myself again, if you weren't there on day one, I am Bob McLean. Uh, I'm one of the rare book librarians at the University of Glasgow Archives and Special Collections, uh, and I'm one of the conference organisers here. Uh, helping me out today is going to be Christine McGowan, who's the, the day events coordinator for SILIP RBSCG uh, and soon to be of the University of Edinburgh. Um, and we've also got Lucy Evans uh, helping out today from the British Library. So this afternoon session, it's going to be three. It's a panel of three 20 minute uh, um, presentations back to back. That's going to be four speakers altogether because our first presentation is a, a dual hander um, and it's going to be the same format as this morning which is uh, questions we're going to leave till the end uh, so we'll have a good kind of 30 minutes or so hopefully uh, maybe a bit more for for questions uh, so hopefully all of these talks will will speak to each other in some way uh, and will allow us to have a, an interesting uh, discussion at the end um, so it's the same uh, uh, rules, if you like, as uh, as we've had previously, which are please just if you could keep your cameras off and your microphones uh, uh, muted, please, uh, during the, the, the presentations. Um, and then at the end, when it comes to questions, we'll be using the, the chat within Zoom uh, and or the raise hand uh, feature within Zoom. Uh, and please don't use the, the Hoover chat function. Also, you'll notice here in the slide, we've got the, the RBSCG21 hashtag. So if you've got any, any kind of uh, contributions or anything, any, anything you want to tweet out about, make sure you, you include that in your, uh, in your tweets on Twitter. Okay, so I think that's it for me in terms of housekeeping stuff. Uh, so we're going to, to move on swiftly to our first presentation of the, the, of the afternoon session. Um, and this is going to be given by uh, Sarah Pittaway, who's the Head of Library Academic Engagement at The Hive at the University of Worcester. Uh, uh, Sarah is, um, uh, the, the Hive, for those of you who don't know, is home to Europe's first integrated public and university library. Sarah's career has encompassed a variety of teaching, subject librarian, librarian and e-resources roles. She's worked at the University of Birmingham before moving to Worcester in 2013. She's a senior fellow of the HEA, that's the, the Higher Education Academy, and holds a PhD in medieval studies, having flirted with an academic career prior to uh, going over to the dark side and embracing life as a librarian. Uh, speaking with Sarah is going to be Stephanie Jones, who's library manager at The Hive. Uh, Stephanie began working in, the, in, uh, in libraries in 2016. She's got a background in hospitality, in catering and customer service, uh, and has a PhD in English literature from Aberystwyth University in British experimental literature. Um, and their presentation this afternoon is called Digitally Dependent but Technologically Restricted inequalities of access laid bare by COVID-19. So take it away, please. Thanks, Bob. Just give me a moment to share my slides. There we go. Hopefully everyone can see those. So um, yeah, it's great to see so many of you here this afternoon. Um, obviously, this conference is kind of uh, looking at some of the exciting cutting edge applications of, of science and technology as it applies to the world of, of rare books and special collections. Um, so you might be wondering what on earth we're doing here with this particular topic, um, but we're kind of going to give you the, the other side of the, of the coin, if you like. It's a bit of a, a plea, really, not to forget about digital inequality um, in all the excitement of, of digital development. And as you'll have heard from our, our bios there, neither one of us are, are special collections librarians or conservators, although obviously I do have a PhD in, uh, in medieval studies, so I have worked with some of your rare books in the past. Um, but we're going to we're going to give you this kind of uh, story of our experiences over the past 18 months, what we've learned during the pandemic, um, what we've learned about digital inequality in particular during that time, and it's specifically through the lens of working in the hive, um, uh, which is, Bob said, is our sort of the first integrated public and university library. So the hive is a partnership between the University of Worcester and Worcestershire County Council which means it's got a fully integrated library service 
which enables members of the public to borrow academic resources and to have access to a number of different e-resources that they wouldn't usually be able to in a regular public library. The university students and staff benefit from being able to engage with the local community and take part in activities and events. They engage in work placements and volunteering opportunities, which again wouldn't be part of a standard university experience. The complexity of the building and the partnership means that our customer base is extremely wide and has a diverse range of needs. Library customer advisors are expected to adapt and evolve depending on who they're assisting. It's very possible that at one minute they might be assisting a member of academic staff to find a book and the next they'd be helping an elderly person apply for a blue badge. The work is extremely varied and often very busy. And on any given day, we would expect between 1,800 and 2,500 visitors. Specialised academic inquiries are escalated to Sarah's team of academic liaison librarians, but the large majority of the face-to-face -face inquiries are handled by the front of house team. And they are recruited for skills in customer service, basic IT literacy and communication as the role is dependent on these qualities. While the partnership is extremely beneficial, it is also necessary that this integrated service is managed sensitively and diligently in order to maintain the interests and values of both partners, giving each a voice and an identity within the shared vision of the Hive. My role at the Hive is to manage the front of house library service, including the inquiries from the, student, from the university students and to manage the teams that deliver these services. Whereas my role is much more about leading the team who manage the in-depth work with students and academics. So we're handling the complex inquiries, as Steph has mentioned, um, we're teaching our students information literacy skills, um, really working within curricula, um, doing a bit of UX work, working with our academic colleagues, student led projects, that sort of thing. So primarily focused on one side of the partnership, but very much within the whole ethos of the Hive and working closely with, with Steph and her team. And I think the one thing we really want you to take from, from all of this we're telling you about the Hive is that the point of the Hive actually is that it shouldn't matter who you are as a customer. If you come into the building, you'll be treated with the same care and respect and get the same excellent service, no matter who you are. However, during the pandemic, it did matter who you were. So that was both in terms of the service we were able to provide to our different customer groups, um, but also in terms of what we learned about their various digital needs. And I think we all recognise my slides move forward. We all recognise that we saw uh, this real magnification of digital need during the pandemic. You know, everything and everyone moved online at speed. So I'm sure there's people here who perhaps had to have, um, you know, an online doctor's appointment that we'd never done before. Um, you know, helping your parents to do their first online shop, those sorts of things. That suddenly became very, very important. And then we, we really learned very quickly how this was experienced in practice for those different customer groups that we've got. It really shone a spotlight on how different their lives are and how those inequalities started to be played out and impacted on them during the pandemic. So um, before we get into the kind of the story of what happened, I think it's quite useful to think about um, the sort of conceptual framework. And this is a digital exclusion pyramid from uh, the Good Things Foundation. And I think it's a nice, useful way of thinking about, about digital inequality and digital exclusion, because I think when we talk about digital poverty, for example, the first thing that people think of is, of course, oh, people don't have access to a, a laptop or a tablet or, or, or a phone. But actually, it's, it's there's layers to it. So you might have the laptop, but you don't have the connectivity. You know, you can't have can't get a reliable broadband, or you don't have mobile data. Um, above that, there's the digital skills themselves. So you know, digital literacy, digital fluency that people talk about. So you might have the things, but you don't really know what you're doing with them. And then, of course, at the top of that pyramid, there's, you know, the, the personal goals, the rationale for why you're engaging digitally in the first place. For our students, that's really obvious. It's part of their studies. But as Steph has said, you know, actually for uh, an older member of the community, maybe they need to get online to order a blue, bla blue badge, which they've never had to do before. Or that, you know, that online shop they've never done until the pandemic hit. So to all of these things, and it's useful to bear that in mind. And, and when we're talking about digital inequality for our customers, we could be talking about any one of these things or some combination of them. And the only thing that's really missing for me, actually, from this pyramid, um, which I think is particularly pertains to students, is a space in which to be digital. Um, you know, somewhere you can go and actually engage in being online that's away from everything that's going on in your home. And again, we'll, we'll reflect on that as we go along in this presentation. So like everyone, we, we headed into lockdown in March last year. We, we headed right into lockdown at the very last moment uh, with, with national lockdown. 
And for our students, um, we didn't move them physically in, in trolleys, I should point out, I just really liked this picture, but moving them online was actually a relatively seamless experience. So a lot of our students were, were reasonably digitally savvy, I would say. So our eBooks are used um, really well already. We have something like twice the national usage of eBooks. We had a well-used um, online chat service. Um, and then when we moved sort of, you know, into, into lockdown, we extended our chat hours. We about doubled our chat hours but we quadrupled the actual demand on the service. Um, and then we implemented online teaching, online appointments. So it was quite a lot of upskilling for my team um, to get their heads around. Um, but by and large, the students were okay. You know, they were still asking the same kinds of questions that they had asked us prior to everyone, everything going online. So they're still asking about referencing, information finding, et cetera. And actually, for some of them, online teaching suited them a lot better. You know, they felt more confident to ask questions in a, in a Teams chat or a Zoom chat than they would ever have felt doing in a classroom. So there were some positives there. The main issue, I think, for our students was, was that traditional layer of digital poverty that we saw at the bottom of the pyramid. So not having the actual kit that they needed. And the university was able to step in there um, and provide, there was a digital hardship fund that students could apply to, to help them get laptops, to help them get some connectivity. And even things like um, noise cancelling headphones were really important for our students. So coming back to the idea of space in which to be digital, you know, a lot of our students are mature students, they've got kids at home, they've got care responsibilities. We've got a lot of students from the local area who haven't actually moved out, so they may be at home with younger siblings running around. And um, I think many people here today will know about all the different um, challenges there were when we all started working from home. And our students were no different. So something as simple as noise cancelling headphones, that enables you to, to focus on the digital space, even when the sort of physical space around you is, is quite chaotic. Steph? So we had to move quite quickly to build uh, and develop a Worcestershire Library's digital offer uh, that was useful and appropriate for our public customers across the county. And this included the inauguration of digital social connecting bubbles, including book bubbles, knitting bubbles, and other bubbles, uh, more targeted for children and families. We also engaged many of our customers with webinars and online events specifically designed to improve people's confidence and knowledge around using digital resources like Zoom and BorrowBox, uh, Libby and PressReader, which had the knock-on effect of improving people's digital literacy. And what became abundantly clear, however, what was that while we were assisting people to feel more confident and to improve their digital literacy in cases where they had a device but didn't necessarily know how to use it, we were not able to reach those people who were experiencing digital poverty or indeed a combination of the two. Uh, and we knew that we weren't reaching these people because while the library doors were closed, some, some members of the front of house county council uh, team um, were redeployed to support the Here to Help scheme. And this scheme utilised library staff from across the county to support a telephony service designed for people who had been impacted in a serious way by the pandemic, either because they were unable to leave the house due to shielding or because they weren't able to engage with the service anymore due to the fact they'd all gone online or that they had closed. These cases range from people calling uh, who needed emergency food deliveries, which may have been because they were financially stretched and couldn't afford food, in which case we would arrange emergency food, emergency food parcels for them. Or it could have been that they were not digitally capable of ordering an online shop, in which case we supported them to get a delivery slot and to register with supermarkets, etc. However, there were also more extreme cases where people needed medication urgently, people who were homeless and didn't have anywhere to have a food parcel delivered to or people whose mental health had deteriorated so significantly uh, and they were in need of assistance. And so we had to assist that by booking medical appointments via digital systems for them. For the most part, these people were in dire need of information, advice and guidance around navigating digital systems. And indeed, in most cases, were unable to access, basics, to access a basic service because of both digital illiteracy and digital poverty. So again, just to, to, to really highlight that stark contrast between some of our customers and, and shows that the digital space that they're working in, the, the public generally working, is actually much, much smaller than that of our students. Um, so even though students were struggling with some elements of digital exclusion or inequality, I think they were working from a higher starting point by and large, and they had more supports to transition digitally. 
And so thinking back to that pyramid of digital exclusion, we, we can see our public users definitely suffering from no technology and or no data uh, connectivity and or no skills. And it's the uniqueness of our library service, our partnership, that's given us this real sense of the whole spectrum of digital inclusion and exclusion. Um, so on the 4th of July, the Hive reopened its doors for limited computer access and click and collect book collection. And in fact, that was true of almost all of our Worcestershire libraries as well. They reopened at that time as well. Um, our customers were overjoyed to be able to once again access the facilities in the library. And for the most part, the feedback from this time was exceptional. We also continue to work digitally and with digital partnering with uh, an organisation called Digital Lifeline Project. Uh, in order to support adults with learning disabilities who didn't have a device or who didn't have an adapted device to suit their needs. Uh, library staff and digital champions were trained by AbilityNet in identifying and downloading apps for people with additional needs. We worked on Devices.now project, which became the Everyone Connected project. And with lottery funding, we were able to identify people who had no internet or no device, or people who were disabled with low income and provide them all with a device uh, which had preloaded internet and provide digital one-to-one -one appointments to show them how to use that device. Um, since Easter, we've also been able to provide mirrored screening at two metre distance for customers to book appointments with members of staff to do more complex digital tasks, including blue badge applications, uh, things like naturalisation certificates and things like that, really. Um, while it seems relatively late on, considering that the library doors have been reopened for over a year now, with the constant backward forward movement around releasing of restrictions by the government, which has been entirely necessary, um, it meant that the library service was forced to expand and contract in correlation with these restrictions. Uh, there was a constant tension around not releasing too much and too many services, only to have to retract them again, and once again deprive the customers uh, who were most in need. One of the real challenges we faced um, that again highlights the differing social and digital inequalities was the differing gov government guidance in the autumn of 2020 lockdown uh, where the government wanted university libraries to stay open through academic exemption but the local authorities uh, were largely keeping libraries either closed or uh, on very limited services uh, with the declaration of academic exemption we were allowed to provide some consistency for our students um, who since before christmas have been able to come into the library to study and to use PCs in four hour slots. The feedback that we received from the students around this has been excellent and many stated that without this facility, they would not have coped. Unfortunately, we were not able, able to offer this service to students who were not studying at the University of Worcester and who had returned home to their local area from their institutions. Without Sconnell, we were unable to prove their student status and as such, they were regarded as public members who during the lockdown periods were more restricted than our students. However, for those public members who express significant need for, for digital services and help, I work with them locally to try to provide an alternative service. For instance, I granted exemption status to anyone who needed the PCs for online exams, applications to reset, or to apply for extenuating circumstances. For any student uh, from any institution who needed advice or to get away from the family home temporarily uh, in order to get some work done, and it simply didn't make any sense that a unique building and a partnership such as ours was so rigidly confined by the siloing of public services and academic services. And these local occasions were always fully risk assessed and in line with the government safety guidance. But again, this need was made all too clear for the students, both in further and higher education, and their need for digital access and support because of digital poverty. So, so just to, to wrap up really, um, what we tried to do here is to kind of paint you a picture of, of digital inclusion and exclusion as we've seen it over the last 18 months. Um, and as we said at the start, it's really to provide that counterpoint to the exciting digital developments we've been talking about in the other sessions of the conference. It's also to try and um, stop you thinking of digital poverty or digital exclusion in a, in a homogenous way to kind of bring it to life with these different groups that we've talked about. And we really encourage you not to, to lose sight of all of that and all of the amazing work that you're doing. I think moving forward for us, um, the digital offer is going to continue to be uh, key for the Hive. Um, maybe we're not going to be having little robots like this chap here, although there are such robots in some libraries, and I'm sure some of you have, have come across them. Um, but yeah, it's, it, the digital offer is going to continue to be key for academic and public libraries alike. And there's absolutely going to be some renewed focus on upskilling members of the community um, in particular to help them use devices, 
to understand how to access information online, how to engage with online communities in a really safe and responsible way. But I think this, this underpinning idea of digital poverty is just a harder one to solve overall. And again, I think it's a plea for, for you know, public libraries and the protection and the, the maintenance of public libraries, because without access to them, people who are homeless, people who are unemployed or low income, they're simply in no position to pay the price for technology that enables them uh, to access all the services that they so desperately need. So thank you all very much for listening and uh, we'll look forward to your questions at the end of the panel. Thank you. Sarah, Stephanie, thanks so much for that. That was really interesting. Um, and I think uh, a, a useful kind of uh, corrective for us to, uh, to to bear in mind as we're uh, thinking about all the opportunities of technology that we have to think about access uh, and inequality as well. So I'm hoping um, there'll be some interesting questions on this at the end of the panel, and it will probably feed into the round table, I expect, uh, as well. Moving on to our next speaker. Um, I would like to introduce you to Mike Bennett, who is Digital Scholarship Developer at the Library and University Collections of the, at the University of Edinburgh. Mike's a digital library software developer with a particular focus on building tools to aid and assist in the management and, pre and um, uh, presentation of special collections holdings. He was the, the technical side of the, the Bodleian's uh, innovative broadside ballads online project, which I think probably many of us will have used in the past. Uh, and, is, and he currently works at the University of Edinburgh in their digital library team. Mike's paper today is called Creating Catalogues, Experiments with Software Development for Special Collections. Mike, would you like to take a look? Hello. Okay, right now let's just make sure that Zoom is going into the right window uh, and hopefully you'll all see a lovely title slide. Um, so hi, yes, uh, thanks very much for the introduction Bob and for inviting me to speak today. Um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about um, the use of kind of software development and perhaps uh, things that fall outside the traditional purview of the libraries and how they might work to help with special collections um, and an aid in, in some tasks which may kind of seem Herculean when, when approached from a sort of very traditionalist perspective. Uh, I'm going to talk in particular about one collection we have here at the University of Edinburgh um, and uh, hopefully through that sort of show some potential approaches and, and things that can be used to um, to make these things easier. So um, the, the collection we have here at the university is called the Court of Session Papers, uh, and it contains the court records and proceedings from, from the Supreme Civil Court, the Court of Session in Scotland. So that's the Supreme Civil Court, and the records date back to the, the mid 1600s, when there was a court edict, which kind of said, all the proceedings of the court must now be printed and published. Um, so as you can see in the background of the slide, sort of very faintly there, uh, there are some, some very large volumes. So the university holds about five and a half thousand volumes across several of the libraries. Um, but other collections wound up in, in, in other places. So we work with some colleagues at the University of Virginia. In their law library, they hold, um, I think, seven or eight sort of boxes of unbound papers from the Court of Session. Um, it's not 100% certain exactly why these particular papers ended up in Virginia. Um, but there they are. And yeah, many of these things are, are bound, as you can see in the background, in, in huge volumes. Um, and there's very little cataloguing of them. So we often have, we have a shelf mark. Um, we perhaps have some information from the spine. And then we have data about um, the binding and about the actual physical object but very little about what's contained inside. Um, so the, the raw numbers sort of perhaps show a little bit of the, the size and scale of this collection. Um, there are just under five and a half thousand volumes uh, in Edinburgh, scattered mainly across three libraries. So the University Main Library, the Advocates Library, the Law Library and the Signet Library. 
Um, so for a little pilot project, we digitized 104 volumes, comprising about 117,000 pages, um, which if we take that and sort of extrapolate, means that we have about 6 million pages still to digitize. Um, so this is the sort of scale where doing things by hand beyond the digitization remains out of scope and out of reach um, for the library traditionally. Uh, it's very hard to sort of make a case to say, we need to have somebody transcribe 6 million pages um because that's a very very big task <laughs> uh you know it's 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 the uh, sort of scale where you have you by necessity you're forced to take different approaches um so for our pilot project at the university we we sort of looked at what could we do with the realms of software and machine learning and various other techniques to perhaps make this collection more available because otherwise we, we're going to publish 6 million images online um, with some shelf marks. Uh, so the problem, the main problems we're trying to solve is how can we actually produce a rich catalog out of this material? So, um, you know, it's, it's possible that we can, we can put the shelf marks online and you could find stuff. So there are published guides um, you will find sort of a companion guide to the session papers, 1700 to 1750, listing the interesting cases. Um, so if you find that, then you might know which volume you need to look in or volumes. You then still have the problem of uh, you might have to page through 4000 pages of text to find the 10 pages in the middle that you're interested in. So again, this is something which is not particularly useful if you're an academic or a researcher looking to use this material um, and so it would be good to to make that more accessible um, but how can we do it in a way that preserves the academic context of the original objects because there are also people who may wish to study other aspects of the collection so for example the fact that these is printed material ranging over several hundred years is an interesting thing if you're looking at say printing history and how printing has changed over time so you might not just want to see the text of the records you might actually want to see the digital facsimile um, and to be able to look at things over several hundred years and compare them to say okay how does this change over time um, so it's important to to approach this and and sort of say what we want to do is unlock this collection for as many uses as possible rather than we're going to digitize it we're going to put the text online and that's the problem you know out the way because there are many different scholarly approaches to dealing with collections of this size and scale um so the first challenge is to just get the text we have a digitized image of the volume, we have you know uh, 1,500 high resolution TIFF files. Um, we need to do something with that first. So the first thing to do is to get the text out. Now I'm not going to go too heavily into the technical details um, in this particular talk, but um, there's, there'll be space uh, for questions at the end uh, if you're sort of more interested in, in some of the nitty gritty technical details. So. Uh, to cover it briefly, we, we started off with the Tesseract open source OCR engine, uh, other, other OCR engines are available, um, and immediately we run into some small problems. So given the age of the material, we have the long S character. Now those of you who work with, with sort of old, old material will have come across this, but it meant that our first rendering of the OCR was full of bithup and vithcount, uh, and everybody had a lisp. Um, now, this is obviously not much use if you need to present an accurate transcription of the text. Um, so there are some techniques you can use to, to sort of deal with this and handle it. We, uh, we looked at training the OCR engine against some existing sources and models, such as the Latin OCR project, um, to sort of help reduce this issue. So working, working with these techniques, we were able to make the, the long S problem kind of go away um so at the end of it we have a transcription of the text 
And the most important thing is that we maintain the coordinates inside the image of every word. Um, and you'll see why. So when this comes out, it looks like this. Um, so you can see over here on the uh, see over here on the right hand side, the content block where it says unto the right honorable the lords of council and session. So there's the actual text and all of the rest of this is saying whereabouts in the page this text is. So this allows us immediately to start doing something more than just providing the list of text. So now that we have all of the text out the document, we can look at, for example, enabling a full text search. So I developed a small piece of software called WIF, which is word highlighting for IIIF. Uh, IIIF is the International Image Interoperability Framework. Uh, so this is a collection of APIs and technical approaches to allow universities, cultural heritage institutions, uh, and others to sort of share images and video and audio from their collections in a way that makes it interoperable, it makes it possible to combine um, resources from different locations, it makes it possible to consume them in a variety of viewers. Um, so this piece of software is used to present the data we extract from the collection in a way that allows people with IIIF compliant tools to come in and consume it and not necessarily be constrained by a single presentation of the data. So one of the things inside IIIF is the search API. So this is a, a defined way of allowing any client or viewer that implements it to do searching inside of a document. Um, and so what it actually looks like in reality is this. So now we have all of these huge volumes and you want to find cases related to James Montgomery. So we can do a search and not just tell you, oh, you want to look in this volume and this volume and this volume, but we can show directly from the image uh, real-time snippets. Now these are generated in real time when you search. We don't pre-compute or pre-compile all of the searches people might want to do. This, these snippets are drawn directly from the source images. Um, and this to me is like a really powerful exposition of searching text across historic collections, because normally what you might get in a traditional search view is just a list of results. And that might not be very helpful, um, depending on what you're searching. You may have some very specific thing where seeing the results in context gives you a better idea of what you're looking at. Um, so you can see, for example, here, the fifth result down is a list. It says here that James Montgomery shipmaster in Irving. So this might help you sort of find a thing. Um, and then you can click through. So if you click onto one of these links, you can go to a sort of full view uh, of the of the things in context. So this is a IIIF viewer called the Universal Viewer. And as you can see on the left hand side, there's a kind of page by page uh, view. And the searching here is taking you directly to those usages of James Montgomery inside the text. So this is a full text search that maintains the original context of the results with reference to the digitized object. So rather than just being handed a page of text, like a, a PDF, you know, here's all the text we extracted, you can go in and see directly in the digital facsimile where your search results come from. So to me, this is a sort of very powerful first step towards unlocking the content and making it more visible and usable um, beyond, you know, the very basic, here's some text, you can, you can search it. So, okay, this is pretty neat, but it still requires you to know exactly what you're searching for and to do some text searching. So are the ways that this can be enhanced, again, without 
having somebody go through six million pages by hand uh, and create catalog records for them. So for the next step in the pilot project, we started to look at textual annotation for the documents. So this is an approach to add rich information to text corpora, um, you know, so that you can you can tag. It's a, a little bit like adding HTML markup to something. You can add uh, some things to, to indicate this is the title of the document. This is a person. Uh, this is a place name. This is you know somebody's occupation. Um, so this allows you to build up richer data, which you can then use. Um, and there's some existing tools for this process. So there's a well-known tool called BRAT, um, which is a text annotation tool. Um, but these things are typically designed just for working on raw text. They're less designed for special collections, where, again, the important thing here is for us to preserve the context in the original media. Um, and most of them work by hand. So they're feasible if you have a, a small corpus to kind of go through and, and annotate, uh, and maybe not if you have six million pages. So the approach we took to, uh, to this was to, to look at natural language processing and machine learning. So uh, I'm sure that some of you will have sort of started to come across this in your, your institutions. It's very rapidly expanding area inside the humanities um it's sort of very traditionally comes from computer science and from informatics um and in the in the last decade or so humanities are really starting to look at this as as a way of uh, approaching sort of humanities problems that you you know may not have been considered as computer problems uh, a decade ago so there are some things which are already quite well solved. Uh, there exist products and, and processes and software that can take away a lot of the donkey work from the annotation process. So for example, named entity recognition. So this would be you give the tool a bunch of text and it comes back and it puts in tags for you where there are place names or people's names. Um, so this you know, means you don't have to go through and find every instance of Mr. Robert Smith. That will just be done for you. So already that makes a huge difference across uh, such a large corpus, six, six million pages. Um, there's still some issues. So there's excellent training sets are based on modern English documents. So for stuff like the session papers, they don't necessarily work as well. Um, and they are designed for generalized problems. So you will be able to get people's names, but you might not be able to get people's occupations because this is something maybe domain specific to the material. Um, it's maybe, you know, not in the, the, the sort of biggest um, problem faced by the people who've looked at these things before. So the data doesn't exist, but any amount of reduction in the work is very powerful for libraries and for collection staff because again it, it means you don't have to have somebody to do six million pages by hand so to this end we built a small tool called the editor tool which is an annotation tool designed specifically for working with transcribed images from special collections uh, and it's based around AAAF that i sort of mentioned before and it uses natural language processing um, to preserve uh, custom components there to preserve the references to the original images, which is not normally what happens right with natural language processing normally you have the text and the output and you discard the image as as irrelevant you're only interested in the text, whereas if you're coming from a collections background you're interested in the image as well, and you want to keep that. So this tool is kind of building on similar approaches from from informatics and computer science areas, but focusing on special collections and helping to build catalog data and, and metadata about large digitized volumes. So it looks slightly like this when it's in use. So what you can see here is that you have uh, on the right hand side, the original page image. Uh, and although this is a static image, so I can't really show you, that's in a zoomable viewer. So it's possible to kind of zoom right in on the high resolution image and move it around. Um, 
that's just the full resolution TIFF file there at uh, 8,000 by 16,000 pixels or so. Um, and on the left side here, we have the bits of data that were extracted by the machine learning algorithm. So you can see from this list of entities that uh, it picks up place names, people's names, um, Lord Fullerton, so people's titles. And what we do with this tool is add in some extra data to build a machine learning model to kind of make this richer. Um, so you can see in the comments column, some some notes from from one of the people working on the project, E.B. Salter, who is correcting things. So if you look at entity number two, you can see the the text actually transcribed it as Watka. It misrecognized that L character. Um, and so E.B. has corrected this using um, a method, you know, a vocabulary we constructed um, so that we could machine process the results of that. Uh, and we have things here. So this role column is picking up now with a machine learning model, more detailed information. So whereas you may have just got person for Walker and for Lord Fullerton, now we're actually able to say by processing the text that Walker is, is the clerk of the court. Um, so you can see on the, the right hand side here, Mr. Walker clerk. So this gives us straight away more of a more rich information than we had before. So whereas before we could give you a list of the people, now with this tool we're able to say this is the clerk of the court. Um, some other records it lists the the name of the judge. Uh, obviously we have the defendant and the the litigant and the agents involved. So now you start to have more data that can be used to construct a catalogue. Um, so the outputs from this tool and the usage of it is you end up with a data set of tagged data that can be used to improve the model prediction. So you work in a sort of iterative process. The model does a set of predictions. You go through, you correct some of them um, in order to, to make it sort of work better. And then you rerun the model over the data again. So each time you step through, you get better and better data but each time you have to correct less and less. So after a few cycles and a few thousand pages of this data being looked at and corrected, um, the model starts to become pretty accurate and, and good for running across all 6 million pages to produce rich catalog records. So you end up with domain specific data about the contents of the text. Um, we use the AAAF methods to make it open and interoperable so that it's not just the presentation from the holding institution, but anybody in the AAAF universe can sort of come in, use this data, take it away, and have it all linked together, still referring back to the original digitized images. Um, and for me, the most important thing, it unlocks the collections resource. What was previously 6 million pages of text now has context. It now has more information. It's now actually usable as a resource. Whereas before it, it really wasn't unless you had a lot of time and dedication. Um, so the key learnings that, that came from this project really is that using technology to do the heavy lifting can be of huge use for making collections accessible. Uh, this the court of session records, these things here would have just remained dusty volumes on shelves um, without this approach. Even being digitized, they would have just remained a massive collection of digital images that were not very usable. So by stepping away from traditional library things and bringing in stuff from informatics and computer science, we were able to, to unlock this collection but it would not have worked without very close involvement, hand in hand working with our library colleagues and colleagues in archives and domain specialists about the data. It would have been very difficult to just take this away and say, give it to an informatics PhD student and say, please build an annotation tool for this material. Because you still need the, 
the, the library approach to curating the data, to presenting the data, to knowing which data is important to extract. So this sort of interdisciplinary work between libraries and, and computer science approaches is the thing that underlines, is the foundation that makes the whole project successful. Um, and the last thing is to not be scared. The outputs will never be perfect. Um, there's a lot of hesitance sometimes in libraries to, to look at AI because you see the bad examples. You see things like the Google image tagging, which comes back and has used some undesirable terms to refer to things in photographs because it's a machine learning model. It has flaws. Um, but for projects like this, the outputs, whilst not perfect, provide a very, very good base and take away a lot of the heavy lifting again. It's about making things feasible, not about making them perfect. Uh, that's the job of people because machines will never do that. Um, so yeah, thanks. Thanks very much. I hope that was interesting and informative. Uh, and I look forward to answering some questions at the end of the session. Mike, that was really fascinating. Um, I thought you, you managed to explain something that's quite involved and technical in a very uh, straightforward way that even, even I could understand. <laughs> so you did a great job and your neighbor also seemed to cease and desist with the hedge trimming uh, that you were yes. worried about. Yeah, they, the they did. They actually, they were going up until about a minute before you introduced me. So it was perfect timing. <laughs> Well, well, mine has now started, so do apologise to everyone if they can hear a background noise. That is uh, just one of my neighbours trimming the hedge. Um, and on another thing, I think uh, the librarians everywhere will be uh, cheering at this pilot project to try and make the session papers more accessible. And I may well be in touch about how we can try and how I can, for my own research, try and um, um, uh, use your uh, the, the, the outputs of your project. Um, we will but we'll move on now to the next speaker uh, and we can revisit uh, questions for you afterwards. Uh, and this is our last speaker of the, the panel. Um, this is Martin Hamilton, who's the principal of martinh.net Unlimited. Martin is a digital innovation consultant who's been working around the intersections of the internet and academia for uh, around 30 years, starting with the eLib program in the 1990s. In a varied career, he's worked as an internet researcher, uh, and this is his uh, uh, mic drop. He's responsible for the www dot, which I think is quite impressive. Uh, and he says, but don't hold it against him. I think that's pretty impressive. Uh, he's run a supercomputer center and led the innovation lab at JISC. So it's, it's a pretty good bio, this one. These days, Martin advises uh, organizations on how best to get the most out of emerging technologies like AI, artificial intelligence. Uh, and that is the subject of his talk today. It's new science out of old books, AI, artificial intelligence, and special collections. So um, I'll hand over to you, Martin, please. Well, thanks very much, Bob. And um, I think that the previous talk was a great intro for this one. So what I'm gonna try and do in this talk, and hopefully you'll See my slides popping up any second now. This looks promising. Um, what I'm going to try and do in this talk is uh, I'll talk about some particular examples of how people are using AI in, in practice in, a, in this context. So looking particularly at rare, rare books and manuscripts. Um, I'm going to also kind of walk us back to kind of general principles. So what, what the heck is this anyway? <laughs> how do you use it? What kinds of things do people do with it? And then I'll close off by looking at what the future might hold. So that's that's my game plan for today. I'm looking at the clock, so we've got about 20 minutes. Let, let's see how it goes. Um, so first off, uh, I'm not going to I'm not going to reiterate all the stuff that Bob said. Apart from um, I cut my teeth as as a, a chambrarian, I think the phrase is, back in the ELIB program in the 1990s, and I recently wrote a retrospective article looking at how ELIB informed all the stuff that's gone on in library and information science uh, since the 90s. If anyone's interested in that, it's in Ariadne. We'll share these slides and you will have the links to the material uh, that I'm using in the slides. I've linked in many cases to research papers 
and articles covering particular techniques and technologies. And the thing on the right is my woo moment. I actually kind of put this out of my memory until recently. Um, back in, in the 90s, there were a lot of people trying to figure out how does the internet scale up? How, how do we take something that a handful of researchers are using and make it applicable and useful to everybody? And one of those things turned out to be we, we've got to have short names that people can type in because you're going to see something on the side of a bus or you're going to read an advert in a paper and it's important that those names be short, memorable, easy to type in. And then we ended up with well, well, well as a, as a consequence of this one particular piece of work, which is an um, internet best current practice. So that's my, that's my claim to fame. <laughs> but more recently, I have been uh, spending quite a lot of time uh, looking at futures uh, in a slightly more formal sense. So this is my SoundCloud moment. If you think this talk's interesting, I wrote a chapter in this rather excellent book that um, Lucy Ellison and David Baker edited on future directions in digital information, available from all good bookstores. Uh, like I say, if you're interested, do, do check it out. But back to the AI. So my contention is actually, we, we often talk about AI as, as though some kind of futuristic sci-fi thing that one day could change everything. And actually the truth is it's already all around us. Uh, you know, for example, a trivial thing, the background behind me isn't really behind me. It's a picture. This is a virtual background. There's a little bit of AI code, which is detecting me and superimposing the background. You might just ooh, see that clock, uh, not clock, light disappear. And yes, you probably see at some point my thumb might disappear. Ooh, maybe not this time. The AI is all around us. It's built into the apps, the websites, other products and services that we use every day. We generally don't think about it because we don't have to. We just use the, the product. Um, and I think there's something that's really quite unhelpful, actually, in the way that we tend to, to think about AI is it, generally it's represented as kind of humanoid robots um, and what, what AI researchers would generally call artificial general intelligence so you know let's imagine a kind of humanoid robot that can ask any question it knows all the information in the universe and i'm going to show you in this talk ai is not like this so you can go off and you can google ai click on the images tab and you'll see a ton of these pictures of robots looking thoughtful um you know doing something and some somehow ai is meant to be implicit in all of this it really isn't like this yeah, not, not in the slightest. Um, what it is like is an alphabet soup of acronyms, of technologies, and, you know, I won't, I won't go into detail about any of these, but the important thing to note is that there's a, there's a kind of recurrent theme here, machine learning, neural networks, kind of basically trying to uh, replicate certain processes that we um, understand and take place inside people's brains, so how is information represented inside people's brains. Um, to get your head around this, it's fair to say that if you really want to learn about it, there is quite a lot of maths involved. I only have one equation in this talk, and I won't show it to you uh, until close to the end, so uh, prepare yourselves. There will be an equation, but there, there won't be questions, so there, there won't be homework. So you can look at it and you can make your own judgment. But yeah, it's an alphabet soup of um, terminology, acronyms, and it's quite hard to get your brain around. So I'm gonna try and do, uh, in the space of a couple of minutes, just walk you through some key concepts. And again, uh, I'm linking to background material that you can follow if you're interested in learning more. Um, what do we really mean by AI right now. And my contention is essentially most of the AI that we talk about right now is about classification. It's about finding things that look like the thing we're after. And in this rather cute example here, we've got we've got this kitten. Oh, oh such a cute kitten and the puppy. Ah. Um, and somehow or other, AI lets us say, okay. I want to find a picture that has the cat in it. 
that's that's classification. A lot of a lot of early AI algorithms really just did that. So I want to find some pictures that have cats in. Um, when you're training your AI, you need to give it lots of material, and you need to say, right, this is correct, this isn't. If you don't have that material up front, then someone needs to supervise it. Someone needs to say, no, you got that one wrong. That's not it. And really, that process, the, the AI learning process, the, the machine learning, um, it, it, it isn't massively more complicated than that. What we're saying is, nope, you've got that one wrong. Yes, that one's right. And over time, and usually with exposure to quite a lot of source material, it gradually learns what is right and what is wrong. But sometimes what it learns is, you've shown me lots of pictures of cats with grass in the background. Therefore, if I see a picture with grass in the background, it's probably a cat. And as we'll see as I go on in this talk, it's very easy to leap to the wrong sorts of conclusions because the AI said so. And as Mike said, you know, the, the AI can be really helpful, but you should be very careful about the extent to which you take what the AI tells you as gospel truth and like, I'm going to take action based on, on what the AI, AI said. Um, talking about classification, well, okay, there's a cat in this picture somewhere. Localization, actually this bit in the middle is the cat. So, you know, let's picture we're looking at some rare manuscripts and things like that. It may not be enough to know that a particular person's handwriting appears at some point in this manuscript or even on this page. Might want to localize it down to a particular line, paragraph, and so on. Um, when you see video of self driving cars, it's become quite popular now to post videos of what the AI sees. And you often see these colored blocks denoting particular types of object. So in this case, it's some cute animals. And you know, we should just take a moment to, to reflect on how, how lovely they look. But more typically, it's here is the car and there is whoop, a, a cyclist or whoop, a pedestrian or you know maybe there's an obstacle in the road or a traffic light or something like that. And you'll see a lot of these. In fact, if you Google Y-O-L-O, -O, you only live once, uh, you'll find an awful lot of those sorts of videos showing the AI's uh, improving ability to detect these sorts of things. So object detection could be pretty handy because actually we want to know here's a thing which has certain items in it. And actually I'm only interested, you know, here's a 6,000 page manuscript. I'm actually only interested in the pages that have X, Y, and Z in them. So object detection can be, can be pretty cool, but also which bit really is the object? And if we can be a little bit more specific, so this instance segmentation, well, there's a couple of kittens in there. Um, where exactly are they? Um, where, where is the rubber duck? So it, this is really useful to be able to do in, in lots of ways. And again, I've put a link in here to an article which just looks at what those different options might look like. But the key thing is, what we're saying is, is similarity. Find me something a bit like something that you've seen before. And that is, I, I would argue, is really the, the fundamental underlying principle of most of the AI that we use, that we talk about, um, that we pontificate about right now, really boils down to that one simple thing. So let's spend a moment looking at what people are doing with it. We, we had a great example just now from Mike. Um, I've got a couple of examples too. Um, so you may have read about this. This is actually a couple of years ago now. Uh, a study that got quite a lot of news coverage, AI detecting who really wrote Shakespeare's plays. And of course, there's been ongoing theories and speculation about other people who may have been involved in Shakespeare's written output and who really was Shakespeare anyway. Um, two people in particular who've been linked to Shakespeare, John Fletcher and Philip Passenger, um, ongoing speculation that they may have been involved in some of his plays, um, such as Henry VIII. And this particular paper here, we've got a link to the paper and the extract on the right. In this paper, they analysed um, they analysed Henry VIII um, act and scene by scene. So what they've done here is they've said, okay, we we think using using machine learning, using AI, we're pretty confident that these first two scenes were written by Shakespeare. 
but actually we're pretty confident the next two were written by um, this John Bletcher character. And that's very interesting. And well, you know, I think that there's traces of um, Philip Massinger in, in this one and this one. And, and the key thing to note here is it's a kind of percentage based approach. It's a confidence and interval based approach. And that's what you should really expect when you're working with AI is you're really asking it a little bit like you might ask a human, you know, well, well, how confident are you about that? It might say, no, you know, I'm pretty confident. Or it might say, mm, could be. Um, and sometimes you will get absolute certainty from the AI. But even if you do, you should question it just because, as I said before, it's quite easily fooled. And I will give you an example or two of that. Um, how did they do this? Well, of course, there's lots of material that Shakespeare published. And quite a large chunk of that, Shakespearean scholars are pretty confident, is the work of this one person generally known as Shakespeare. We can argue about his, his background and origins and all the rest of it, but this is one person's work. And similarly, Fletcher and Massinger had a body of published work too. So when we wanted to train the AI, we could say, OK, we'll have a bit of this, a bit of that. So they used um, 53 examples from Shakespeare himself, 90 from Fletcher, and 46 examples from, from Massinger. So not millions. We don't necessarily always need millions of images, billions of words, uh, and things like that. So um, from, from that, these scholars were able to get a reasonably good idea, not just of which bits Shakespeare himself didn't write, but actually of those other writers who, who might have contributed to it. And there's a bunch of techniques uh, generally bracketed under stylometrics about writing style, um, you know, based on all, all kinds of things like use of vocabulary, sentence structure, sentence length, and so on. The AI doesn't really know about any of that. The AI is taking a much more naive approach. And as I say, it's kind of more, it's more based on self-similarity. What, what is this like? Another example I, I was quite um, excited about this year was uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls. So there's one particular um, Dead Sea Scroll called the Great Isaiah Scroll, which is a copy of the Book of Isaiah, which is found in both the Hebrew Bible and the Old Testament. And the conjecture is, actually, we think this is written by two people. I mean, it's a, it's a big old undertaking copying one of these things out. I think it was undertaken by two people with similar handwriting. Um, or maybe, you know, that one person was just trying to copy the style of the other one. And so you can read the, the uh, paper for yourselves. But essentially what the researchers did was they looked at not just the, the characters, um, but also the individual um, components of the characters, which are called fraglets. So they looked at fraglets. Um, to help them understand, you know, when someone draws this particular character, I don't know, Aleph, um, do they always draw it the same way? And is there, a, you know, are there two consistent and different approaches to drawing that character? So if you're looking at um, a, a rare book, a manuscript, or perhaps as, as Mike said, you know, scanning, scanning the text of one of these types of documents, extracting the text so that you can do further processing on it, these are the kind of questions you might want to answer. And I think it's really important to think of it in terms of, I have a question I want to answer, not just, hey, how can I use AI? If you've got a question that you want to answer, which is proving very hard to answer uh, with people and limited time and resources available, then it might be that um, AI could help you to do that. Um, where AI couldn't help was the Voynich manuscript, which is 240 pages of unique script, possibly in code, with some rather strange diagrams like this one showing a number of nude women bathing in an unknown liquid. Fantastic. Um, there's a paper which has been widely uh, cited talking about using uh, machine learning and other techniques to, to try and decipher the Voynich manuscript, generally reported as AI gets to the bottom of this, but the truth is they didn't. And when your stuff is sufficiently unique, then there's only the one extant thing of its type, may just not be able to get to the bottom of it. 
So you've got to keep that in mind as well. AI can help you, but only up to a point. And there are there are real hard limits. So what does the future hold? Um, it's always nice to ask this question. I, I worked as a futurist for a number of years, so I've, I've had the luxury of being able to spend a lot of time thinking about this. Um, what the future holds, I think, is probably quite a few examples of things like this. It's, it's where the AI yeah, got a little bit confused or when people were training an AI and they didn't necessarily think about the bigger picture. And in the bigger picture of uh, Google Photos, probably many of you use this app, uh, in the bigger pic picture of Google Photos, it didn't occur to the developers that perhaps it might get a bit confused once in a while and actually really did tag people with dark um, colored skin as gorillas. So this one um, developer here looked at his Google Photos app and said, whoa, what's going on here? He tweeted about this, this is 2015. Google's solution, which is, I, I checked earlier on today and this is still the case. Google's solution was you can't have gorillas and actually um, other um, apes, primates, etc. cetera, they're, they're just blocked as keywords in Google's um, auto classification of images. That's a little bit disappointing. You think a company with Google's resources would go, oh, wait, hang on a minute, we screwed up here. Let's make really sure this doesn't happen again. And that's important to note because when you're doing stuff with AI, you're not Google. Nobody on this call has the resources that Google's able to pull upon. Google still haven't been able to fix this. They've trained their AI with millions of images. You yourselves have probably contributed to that when you've classified friends and family in Google Photos. They still haven't solved this problem. And what's more, other people are reintroducing it. So this is a known problem. Uh, Facebook recently apologized because its video recommendation engine said, oh, would you like to watch some more videos of primates after they watch the video featuring a black man. So this is, it, it's quite a visceral example. I think if anyone's been on this call has been subject to any kind of discrimination based on race, religion, other protected characteristics, you will, you'll feel this quite viscerally. Um, we, shouldn't, we shouldn't accidentally walk into a situation where we've taken what the AI has said as, as gospel, literally, um, as blind faith, we, we just trust the AI, we don't ask questions, but we have got an enormous amount of agency when we're training the thing. And what's really important is that we make sure that it's trained appropriately. So there's that. Um, something else that I think will be increasingly important is uh, what's called adversarial AI. So uh, in the picture on the left, uh, there's a turtle which has been 3D printed with a cunning pattern. The researchers who made it uh, designed a pattern that would confuse AIs trained with a, a common data set called ImageNet. So AI is trained with that data set, which is available as a cloud service you can tap into. Think this turtle is a rifle. And if you don't see why that might be a problem, picture a rifle that they think is a turtle going through a scanner of an airport or something like that. Um, so we'll be quite careful about these things. In the um, rare books, um, special collections type context, then uh, very interesting questions about forgery. Um, how do I know this is the real deal? What happens when someone who has access to the, <clears throat> excuse me, the models and data published by one of those researchers we looked at before says, hey, you know, I think I can magic up uh, some Shakespearean sonnets or something like that. And, you know, I'll find some suitably ancient uh, paper that I can get them inscribed on. Maybe I can fool everyone. Shakespeare's lost sonnets have been discovered. I said I was going to show you an equation. This is the one equation I'm going to show you. Um, how, how do they do adversarial AI? And it's, the answer is the same way they do uh, the classification AI that we looked at originally, which is with some heavy maths. So if you are in, in an area where you're worried about forgeries and fakes, um, be reassured to some extent by that because it is quite hard to do this stuff. Um, so the likelihood of, of your common law garden 
board chair going, hey, I'm going to take a crack at this. Maybe not so great. But a lot of these AI tools are being packaged up in a form that people can just pull down and use. Um, we were talking about that whole classification piece, and you know, maybe sometimes it's actually the grass that gets classified, not the kitten. Um, my favorite example of this is Chihuahua or Muffin, which has become the standard benchmark for computer vision API testing. So if you want to plug in some of this machine learning AI technology, you want to know which one really works. So we're going to throw a bunch of pictures of muffins and chihuahuas uh, and see whether it can tell which is which. And actually, I think there's quite a few of these where the humans would have trouble telling too. So we think about that. We want to use the right tool for the job. We don't necessarily know what those tools are, of course, when we start this journey. But it'd be very easy to spend a lot of time and potentially quite a lot of money and discover that the tool you're using isn't quite right. And that's the kind of thing I, I help people out with. Um, talking about tools that you could get off the shelf, well, here's a nice one. This is just the result of a, a hackathon. They spent 36 hours um, training an AI on uh, Shakespeare's sonnets so that you can now get a, a sonnet on demand from this bit of code. And in fact, if you go to uh, GitHub, it's kind of open source code repository, you can download it. So you yourself can say, okay, generate me a new Shakespearean sonnet. And this is quite an interesting exercise. If anyone uh, on this call has a little bit of uh, experience with Python coding, which is becoming a popular tool to teach people coding, uh, maybe your kids are doing it at school. It's quite a fun little thing to say, okay, look, you know, this is what you can really do with this stuff. If you're worried about forgeries and fakes, then this is the state of the art. Uh, and actually, by the way, they did it in 36 hours at a hackathon. So imagine what somebody who had real intent could do. But hopefully that's um, given you a little bit of an idea about where we're coming from when we talk about um, using AI, that how AI could um, potentially be useful in this context for this community, and a few kind of bear traps and tar pits to be aware of. Um, I'm very interested in talking to people about projects that you might be looking to use AI with. I've got my contact details on here, but also on my profile page on Hoover. And thank you very much today. I uh, really enjoyed doing this talk and I'm looking forward to your questions. Thank you. Martin, thank you very much. That was really interesting. Um, yes, I initially wasn't sure whether to be disappointed or reassured at the, that, uh, that we weren't going to be seeing lots of humanoid robots, but still parts of that talk were terrifying, <laughs> I think it's fair to say, and worrying. Uh, and other parts um, um, show the possibilities um, for the future when it comes to digitization projects, I think, and uh, uh, and how we deal with large numbers of images, which both um, your talk and Mike's uh, touched on. Rather than me rambling on now, though, we've got 30 minutes for questions. Uh, and I think there's, there's all of those talks are, uh, were, were, well, have generated lots of different thoughts in different ways. So why don't we open up to questions here? Just to remind you that is, you can either um, raise your hand using the, the raise hand reaction or uh, drop a question into the chat and we can get started. We've got any questions to kick off? Well, I'll start since, uh, uh, since we uh, um, haven't got any uh, straight away. And I suppose this is to the, the last two talks looking at AI. Um, when it comes to D digitization projects within archives and special collections. There's in the past often been um, these sort of divergent strategies, either mass digitization ones, the big kind of googly type ones, or these um, slightly uh, smaller scale uh, um, kind of uh, slightly more targeted campaigns. Uh, and and the, the bottleneck has often been not the digitization itself, but the description, the descriptive metadata. 
is AI going to be a game changer in this and change the way we look at digitization within archives and special collections? Um, I'm happy to fire in briefly at like this. <clears throat> I think the, the short answer to that is yes. <laughs> uh, the, the long answer is yes, but exactly how still remains to be seen. Um, so some of the stuff that Martin's talk touched on is a really good example of um, areas where AI can be really useful. So for example, categorizing stuff uh, and areas where it can, it can potentially be dangerous. Um, there is a lot of work going on around using AI to, to enhance catalog records, but at the same time, the, the note of caution to sound is that you might not want to just take these things and put them online as a catalog record, given it the equivalency as something created by a specialist human doing the same cataloging, because as you saw in Martin's talk, that can go horribly, horribly wrong. Um, people kind of get annoyed about Google and Facebook and they go, okay, but it's this huge corporation, blah, blah, blah. The outcome for you as an institution, as a library, might be a lot more severe if you put a photo of somebody online and in the description it says, a photo of a gorilla, and it's, and it's a person. So I think that there's definitely the scope for AI to be a game, complete game changer in terms of cataloging in terms of the effort required because it does a lot of the heavy work but whether or not it will completely replace cataloging i think is is a is a different question i think is much less likely okay martin have you got any thoughts on that um i think there's an extent to which probably um so there are some initiatives that have already been doing this on something of a large scale. And we, we talked about Google and Google Books. I think you'd be fairly confident that there's been some application of machine learning in there. I didn't look that one up though, so I couldn't yeah. tell you for sure, but it feels quite likely. And I think that example I talked about earlier on of, of AI kind of worming its way into things. When, when you think about the fact that now, if you say if you have an iPhone, you take a picture with your camera, and if you're on recent versions of iOS, we'll just quietly go, oh yeah, I, I kind of OCR'd that for you. Um, that this stuff is is just being baked in. Um, I think the interesting question for for folk like yourselves as a community is, um, do we do we know where? <laughs> do we know how we can take full advantage of it? Um, because if you if you can get it for free because it's just baked in, then you don't need to go away and you know budget for a massive project and a big yeah. grant to get something off the ground. So those those questions suddenly become really, really interesting. Yeah. A lot of um, open source software on, on GitHub in this area because um, cynically budding developers want to build their CV. And the best way to build your CV as a developer is to put a bunch of code on GitHub that prospective employers will look at and go, ooh, We've got a live one here. You know, we'll get them in for an interview. So it's it, it's a nice kind of self perpetuating um, system, really, in some ways. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks for that. Now we've we've got a couple of questions, and saves you any more from me. Um, Jane, uh, would you like to unmute and ask this one yourself? Yep, I can do. Um, I just I think. I probably more coherent in the chat than I will be in real life but it's really interesting to have that contrast to so the first talk around you know digital divide and digital poverty versus the last two talks that are really about how we use that technology and I suppose I'm wondering to, to all the panelists what that kind of whether there's that tension there um, whether it matters because there are people who um, as Martin was saying are using AI without realizing it, who may, we may consider to be digitally poor so maybe it doesn't matter um, but does it then also limit what some people might like to do because they're not aware of what they can do. Um, so yeah, it's really just a reflection from all the panelists on that digital divide and these um, significant advances in, in using different tech. Thank you. Okay. Well, should we go to, uh, well, Sarah or Steph, do you want to start with that since we haven't heard from you for a while? Yeah, I can do it. Thanks. Thank you, Jane. It's, it's such an interesting question. And I, I'm not sure I've got anything in the way of an answer, but 
but I suppose reflecting on it, I guess some of it, as you say, it, you know, some of my AI stuff is, is being used by people without even knowing about it. So in some ways it's, it's some of it's a non-issue perhaps, but then also I think when you think about that digital exclusion pyramid and thinking about digital skills, there's something about people understanding how they are operating online and how they can do so safely and in an informed fashion. So I think there is there is something there about the, the, the sort of the upskilling of, of probably everyone. I mean, how many of us here don't even think about when we're, we're, we, we're interacting with AI online and then actually it probably is useful just to, to, to know what you're doing. So yeah, not, not an answer, just some sort of reflective rambling. Steph might have something a bit more coherent for you. Absolutely not, as usual. <laughs> um, but what I will say is it's sort of just, just sort of building from that, Sarah, is that I think that it brings into the question of digital consciousness and about um, about how consciously your your average Joe, if you like, is is sort of aware of what they're doing in the world and what impact that might have upon them. Um, and I feel like the closer we move towards uh, automation, uh, the further away people who are experiencing digital illiteracy and illiteracy more than poverty, in a sense, um, how you know the further they become from truly understanding what what they're doing and how they're existing in the world really um and i think that is something that we will we talking as someone who considers themselves to be on the other side perhaps of that divide but probably not um, <laughs> uh, that we've got a responsibility to those people to teach them but to protect them and to help them to protect themselves as well that's a good point. Thank you very much. Martin or Mike, have you got any thoughts on this one in particular? I, I think the um, the digital divide thing is, is bang on because um, mm. I, thinking about my own library in the middle of town, I live in, in Loughborough, a nice little Carnegie library there, mm. there's a local archive. And it would be great, on the one hand, it would be great to use some of these techniques to get some um, extra value out of that archive, get some extra insights from it. I also see that a ton of people from my area come to the library because it's the place they can get online without it costing them stuff. And I, I think there's, a, if, if you squint a little bit, there's a world where uh, some researchers have popped in and are doing something interesting with the archive and there's someone inquisitive, maybe a, a local team who couldn't quite uh, make it at school comes into the library to, to you know, build up their learning and knowledge and says, what, what, what are you doing there? What's all this? And they come away learning a little bit more about these technologies and being able to do something with them. So that's my sort of squint and what could, what could this lead to moment. Yeah. Thanks very much. Mike, have you got anything? It is, it, it, it's a very interesting thing, especially looking at this, this idea of the digital divide. I mean, from, from my background, which is sort of solely an academic librarianship, um, the digital divide in terms of people's knowledge or awareness of AI things still definitely exists, even if you move it away from what you might consider the kind of digital poverty aspect. You know, if you're a researcher at a university, you probably have access to a lot of uh, computing resource, right? You, you you maybe don't use it, but you definitely have access to it if you need it. So the digital poverty is not there, but the digital divide is definitely still there in that I think a lot of people just don't realize what's possible. You see some things of the usage of AI online and people might see things that kind of come as uh, some of these trends you see sometimes going around Twitter. So a while back there was uh, this thing called Wombo which is like a, an AI and it was, you give it a static photograph of yourself and it will make it into a little video of you lip syncing to a recording. So this is a use of AI that a lot of people probably saw and went, oh, okay, that's what AI does. Uh -huh. And they don't consider the things that sort of Martin was talking about or I was talking about where you, could, you can use it for serious academic things. So I think part of our responsibility as technologists who work in this area is to, to sort of build tools and to spend time explaining and working with our, our research colleagues and other people to make this stuff available because it's generally not right if you are a, a language researcher 
you're probably not going to have the technical skills to do something like that Shakespeare analysis. And you might not even know that something like that is possible. So yeah, the digital divide, I think there's a danger it can get higher and it's our, it's part of our responsibility to make sure that we, we sort of go, no, look, these are the things you can do. Let's work cross disciplines to make this happen. There's one for you, Mike, but since you've just answered that one, we'll come back to that. Uh, I can, and, I can uh, answer it directly in the chat. Okay. <laughs> well, uh, Jenny uh, Grimm's got a question here. Jenny, do you want to um, unmute and ans ask this one yourself? I can do. Um, sorry. Hello. Uh, I'm wondering if Sarah and Stephanie have any thoughts on hidden digital skills poverty. Um, so I'm thinking about the push towards digital humanities and the discomfort that some of our academics have expressed privately about interacting with things like digital collections. So what sort of support do you think we can ought to be offering to people who clearly need help, but who are unwilling, ashamed, afraid to be seen as needing that help. Yeah, I, I, again, another another great question. I can certainly speak to this, I think, from um, the academic perspective. So some different research I'm doing with an academic colleague, we've been working on um, accessibility tools to help students engage with reading in different ways, so text to speech, readers and that sort of thing. And when we started the research, what we found from the academic colleagues we were working with was a real resistance to engaging with these digital tools because they felt they needed to be experts in using them. And I, and I think what we've sort of started to theorize around this is that there's a, a lot, for a lot of academic colleagues, they see themselves as experts and they don't want to open themselves up to that, necessarily that sense of, of vulnerability and, and not being positioned with that expertise. And I think that's what happens with when we, we've got a lot of these digital tools, whether it's digital humanities and collections or accessibility tools, we're suddenly destabilizing their position in the center of academia and, 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 and losing their, ex, their, their position as the expert who knows everything. So I think there's, there's a lot to be said for sort of developing kind of a, a community of practice where, where you know, we are talking about librarians, academics, people coming together to, to share expertise, to give people spaces in which to be vulnerable and, and start experiencing some of these things and stimulating that academic curiosity again, because ultimately academics are curious people. That's why they're doing what they're doing. So we can stimulate that again. And some of the stuff that people have been talking about today, Mike and, and Martin, some of the amazing things you've talked about, you would hope that would stimulate that curiosity that would then give them the, that personal need that we saw at the top of the digital exclusion pyramid that then kind of helps them start thinking about, OK, I can build up those skills uh, and there's a space in which to do so. That's my view on it. I think just to answer that, Sarah, like it's, it's really it's going to be really, really difficult to engage. It's always difficult to engage people who who don't want to engage in the public library arena. We call those people harder to reach, either because we literally can't reach them because they live in you know in the rural areas of the county, or because they are um, you know sort of economic, socially economically lower classes, or they are struggling sort of like to find. Uh, the need or use for a library at all, um, to be honest. Um, so I think it's with with these academics that you're talking about. They, they are the same sort of people. They are hard, they are the bird, the harder to reach academics because their courses don't necessarily hinge on the development of technology. And I think that from be, from working in academia for a short for a short period, um, I'm working as an English lecturer to, to make it important to them, to position it as something that is important and to, to show how you can reach students who you might not be able to reach with conventional methods is, uh, is a way for them to see value in it. And if they, if they value it, they'll believe in it and they'll learn. Thanks, Stephanie. There's a, there's a follow on question from Helen, which she's asked me to to read out talking about those people who are outside the academy outside the academy but uh, but who do
do want to work and interact with these sorts of uh, these sorts of tools <laughs> but then they you know don't have the, the university support so maybe your institution obviously slightly different given its its remit but m more generally is this something that particularly you know university related I, I guess special collections digital scholarship needs to to work with the public library sector on do you think if you don't mind addressing that too I think there are so many opportunities for the academic and you know universities to work with the public library sector. I, I think I, I honestly struggle to find to think of a thing that they couldn't collaborate on. <laughs> and again, I know that this is our day to day. You know, for, for Sarah and I, this is this is our this is our bread and butter. This is our basic level of operations. As we go, how can we use the university? How can we use the county? How can we work the partnership to be able to deliver more, better? You know, and that is essentially, our, I mean, that's my entire job, really. <laughs> um, so, you know, really speaking, I, I think I think it's absolutely fundamental, not only to the success and um, you know, longevity, really, of public libraries, but also to just understand why universities are important to our local, are important to our community, you know. The, the elitism and privatization and the idea that 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 there's a sort of wall behind which knowledge exists um actually is no help or use to universities to be honest with you <laughs> and going forward it's going to be a very competitive market so i think that you know we need to consider how universities can make their students um understand what their impact is to the local community but also i think that um the local community needs to see the value in a university being part of their community as well and I think these 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 areas of partner working are just so fundamental to that um, the hive also incidentally is the home to the Worcestershire archive and archaeology service so on level two of the hive that is where and, and part of level zero is where they they live and we do a lot of crossover work with, with them as well as the university and the county council as well so um we I just can't think of an area that we could collaborate on <laughs> sorry <laughs> Sarah, have you got anything to add on that at all? I mean, I think I think Steph's covered it really. I think, you know, I think too often we've got these sort of ivory towers of academia and no one shall pass. And I think the hive is a really great example of actually where we can bring the two communities together. You know, it's a shop window for the university and the community, and it's it's sort of vice versa. It's the way that the academics and the, the students can kind of be involved with the community and have value. So it's it works both ways. And I think that's just something. Okay, not everyone can have a hive. It's a huge project to integrate two library services. I know not everyone can do that, but I do think there's a lot more partnership working that can go on between um, university and public library services that would address some of this this issue here about you know getting people in who want to make use of what's in the academy uh, and don't have access to it currently. Thanks very much. Uh, I've got another one, if if I may, <laughs> for uh, it's really probably mostly for Mike and Martin, but uh, um, uh, but it, it, you're all welcome to to have a bash at it. And it's this this issue that's come up here of um, quite uh, involved expertise and knowledge and the need for collaboration within our sector. And this has actually come up throughout the conference now, uh, where whether it's conservators. Uh, or, or whether it's uh, heritage scientists, or in this case today, um, uh, people from digital library teams and so on. Uh, for, I mean, lots of digital humanities projects that we've done in the past uh, within universities, very often that that expertise has resided within, within the faculty, within the academics, uh, and the archives and special collections workers have been partners in that, but sharing our collections the problem, of course, always is there uh, is sustainability uh, and the long term support for those projects once time passes and that collaboration has broken down. So I suppose what I'm, uh, the, the, where I'm getting to with the question here is that if we're thinking about future skills, recruitment and knowledge, should we in archives and special collections be trying to uh, employ people with the sorts of digital knowledge and skills that say you have Mike here or Martin, uh, people in, you know, with, with AI directly uh, rather than talking about collaborations? I'd like to throw, throw something in here. So um, many universities have um, a, a job role which has arisen in the last few years, but actually a lot of people were doing in reality long before that called research software engineering 
Um, so now RSE is a thing. And this is a, it's taken about 10 years for it to happen. Previously, um, the people were generally hired for research projects on short term contracts. So we, we need somebody who knows about AI. We'll, we'll, we'll see if we can find somebody. Uh, I've got money to pay them for six months. And this, this led to very precarious existences. I was one of those people a few years ago, so I, I, I feel it. I, Mike, I suspect, is, is in a similar position. So um, the difference with, with RSEs as, as a, a concept, really, is that the, the university says, OK, it's, it's in our interest, it's in everyone's interest to have a sort of critical mass, a pool of knowledge and expertise that people can tap into. So if you want to apply for a grant to do some analysis of, of you know, this um, folio collection of, of Shakespeare's um, or whatever it is, um, why not book in a bit of RSE expertise to do the AI part? You know you want some AI expertise. It can be quite hard to just go out and find somebody. And I know this person won't be working for you in your department. They won't necessarily be sat next to you at a, at a desk or any of that. But as the last year has shown us, that maybe isn't actually such a big deal. Um, so RSE is very, very worthwhile if, if you're at a university which is thinking about an AI project, find out if you've got an RSE team, then they might be based in the library, they might be based in the um, IT services department, they might be based in an academic centre. There isn't a kind of one size fits all model, but there may well be an existing pool that you can tap into there. I don't know, Mike, what the Edinburgh picture looks like there. Um, yeah, so I think coming coming from where I do, which is I am a large part of my current role is this kind of research software engineer in the libraries, but it's not very formalized. Um, I'm, I'm technically a digital scholarship developer. I work mostly for the library stuff, although I have done work on research projects. So I work with um, a chap called Lucas Engelman, who was doing a study of the second plague pandemic. Uh, this is, I shall add very quickly, this is several years ago this, <laughs> this happened. Um, and looking at textual analysis of kind of um, documents and, and stuff. So, so we, we use some of the same techniques I talked about with the session paper stuff of OCR and building full text search. Um, I, I think it's really important for institutions and universities to consider their approaches to this, because as, as Martin said, a lot of it in the past has been very precarious. It's very, oh, we'd like this little bit of expertise. So we'll, we'll hire somebody for, for three months or for six months. Um, and the, the problem with that is that actually it, it's hard. It's hard to make things sustainable. It's hard to keep projects running. Uh, you will all have encountered digital rot, I'm sure, right, where there's been some amazing project and it, it's really nice and it's flashy. And then it sits there for three years without being updated or upgraded and slowly it, it starts to break uh, or, you know, things just stop working. But the people who, who were hired for six months to build it, you know, they've gone off to other things. Um, so this is also a slightly selfish viewpoint, but I would really advocate for institutions, uh, especially libraries, to consider about to consider having teams of research software engineers, of digital people who can become a, a part of the core library teams and experience, because the further into the future we get, the more this technology comes into play, the more and more of these projects are happening every year. Um, and so the more sense it makes to me to have people embedded in the libraries with these skill sets. Uh, there's always elements of collaboration. We, we do a lot of work here with colleagues around the university. So I work with a lot of people in the language technology group in the informatics department um, because we use some of the tools and software they write in the library. Um, and likewise, we provide some library services that support the work they're doing. But without both of those groups in place, neither of the things could happen. So it's, I think it's, it's becoming more and more important for, for libraries and institutions to have teams of, of digital people.
you uh, might have noticed that our glorious leader Bob has uh, disappeared. Uh, he, he's having internet problems, so I'm just I'm going to step in now. And unless anyone had any other questions or anything else they would like to add, it will be down to me to say thank you to Mike and Martin, Stephanie, and Sarah, and to all of you for your questions um, in the chat. We'll be closing this Zoom in a second, and uh, but you'll be able to take over and um, add anything on um, on Hoover. Um, so if there is nothing else anyone wanted to ask or, or add, then um, I'll say thank you and we will be back at three o'clock. Thanks everyone. Thanks everyone. Thanks, thanks everybody. Thanks, bye. Bye.